my name is Josh, by the way. And for anyone that's even somewhat associated with the church, especially, you know, sometimes older people, they, they automatically think about John, by the way. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it was very clear early on that I was a member of the church and especially here in Utah, you know, parts of Idaho, Arizona, everyone always asks, you know, almost in like a hushed tone, like, Oh, are you related to John? You know, like, I think every probably eight out of 10 times at the temple, I get asked that, you know, <laughs> yeah, through. I thought about oh, asking you, but I... yeah, everyone does, you know, outside of Utah, Idaho, Arizona, people are just like, that's not really your last name. Anyways. So it, it's no shock that growing up, it was, it was, you know, the, by the ways they're members of the church. Now, just to clear it up, he's a very distant relative. I can't claim anything. I think I've met the dude twice and he was like, Oh yeah, cool. You know, like yeah. he gets it probably all the time from fourth cousins or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up here in Utah. Um, my, my parents, I'm the second oldest of six kids and church was kind of just an automatic thing. Both my parents uh, were raised in the church. My mom, a, a little bit more of an inactive relationship with the church growing up. But my parents, I, I knew from a very early age, had a, had a strong testimony and um, that they really cherished their membership in the church. And I, I really felt that they had had testimonies. Growing up in the church, especially Utah, it, it was more of a, a cultural thing for me. I, I was baptized when I was eight and, you know, I became a deacon when I was 12 and it was just kind of the automatic progression, right? It, it never, I never thought about it. It was just the automatic thing. My older brother did it. My cousins did it. My dad's cousins, like whole extended family. Of course, the by the ways were, were all members of the church, right? So I had a great childhood and I was lucky enough to be raised in a ward where, you know, some of my closest friends, even to this day, we were all in the same same ward. Going to mutual was never a hard thing. Um, I had great spiritual experiences growing up, but around that time that you get to high school, right, you kind of figure out whether or not you're standing on your own thing or if you're going to figure it out and and uh, and go your own way or, or keep relying on the people around you. And I graduated seminary. I, I had never read the Book of Mormon. Um, scripture study wasn't something big in my family growing up. We, we tried at times, you know, especially like around April and October, right? We'd, all right, we're going to read the scriptures. Yeah. We're going to be really good about it. And, you know, life gets busy. It's something that, you know, my family, we, we still struggle with of, of being Same. consistent and reading the scriptures. Same. It's such a hard thing. I don't know. In why. my head right now, I'm like recommitting tonight. Oh, I'm every time, every yeah. time, every, like I said, and I'm in the same category now. I'm like every April, October, someone gives a talk and I'm like, we're going to do it this time. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I graduated seminary. I never read the, read the book of Mormon. I, I knew all the stories. I knew all the answers. I, you know, I, I did all of that. And then my, my older brother went on a mission and it, it kind of started to become like, Oh, okay. Like, is this something I'm supposed to do? I, I never felt the the crippling weight of expectations of a mission, right? I, I'd seen that with other friends that, you know, they were just, they're going on a mission. It's just an automatic thing. And I never felt that from my parents. Um, and I think that they were going to let me kind of figure it out. And it was great that my older brother went and I graduated high school. This was when you still had to be 19 to go on a mission. And I was one of the younger ones in my grade. And so I graduated high school, turned 18 that summer. And so I had a full year to basically, you know, decide if I'm going on a mission or not. I started working full time. I'm going to save money. And I kind of just naturally became disenchanted. I, I no longer had my parents just with the expectation of we go to church on Sunday. Me and a me and a close friend, we started going to the singles ward. But then we started, you know, skipping out on Sunday school and, you know, let's go to McDonald's instead or something or you know, we'd say we're going to Sister Smith's house, but we were actually going to like Smith's the grocery store to get like sushi or something. Right. And and it, it was pretty harmless at the time. But what I didn't realize is that I was I was regressing. Right. I could have taken that year to keep progressing and probably should have read the Book of Mormon and figured it out. But but I was already, you know, going down that other path of, of falling away from the church. Right. So then not that long after I. I met my my first wife and she had a completely different background um, from me. She she did grow up in Utah. She was raised in the church, but, you know, came from like a, a very difficult situation with her parents and, and very messy divorce. And she wasn't part of it at all. And she had 
recently come back from a, a girl's ranch and just, just, you know, she had a lot of struggles and I, I found, you know, I really liked kind of being part of those struggles. And, you know, that was kind of my new identity is, is taking that on and, and thinking that, you know, I had a, a lot of problems and one thing led to another and we actually ended up moving in together. I think it was probably like a month or two before I turned 19. And I just, I completely left. I, I left everything, um, had a pretty big falling out with my parents over, over all of this, because it was one thing for me to just kind of be apathetic, but now I was actively, you know, living a lifestyle that was contrary to what I should have been doing. Um, and with that lifestyle came, you know, obviously, uh, chassis problems and um, it eventually got to alcohol um, drugs a little bit later in life you know kind of like the prodigal son I was just like I'm out of here I'm going to do my own thing and it was that way for a for a long time I mean there were there were long stretches where I I didn't talk to my family they they didn't really know what I was up to and I'd kind of just live my own life and I wasn't openly hostile towards the church at least not at this point yet um but I just I decided I wanted nothing to do with it I obviously wasn't going to go on a mission I was just going to go and find my happiness somewhere else where my story kind of takes a turn to to darker places is uh, a couple of years later I I now married you know um, my first wife and, and by all, you know, measures of, of worldly success, like things were going great. Like I, I had bought a house at a relatively young age. Like I was, I was moving up at the company that I worked at. I was taking on more responsibilities, probably more than a, a 20 or 21 year old should at that, at that time in life. Um, I, I got a big tattoo, you know, that was part of the whole, you know, rebellion thing of, of, you know, look, look how edgy I am. And, I have nothing against tattoos, by the way, but I, I, it was just a, it was a very obvious cry for attention or something. I, I remember my mom, she didn't give me the reaction I wanted. I went to lunch with her and she saw my tattoo and she was like, Oh, okay. And I was like, dang it. Like it didn't even work. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, by all, by all measures, I was doing good. Right. I was, I was successful. I was a young successful person, but I, I wasn't happy and I was still looking for answers. And for whatever reason, I started looking at the church again, but I was looking in all the wrong places. So I started looking into anti-Mormon, anti-church, um, you know, Instagram accounts, forums, all kinds of stuff. And at, at the time it was when um, LGBT, you know, gay rights and stuff was a pretty hot button issue. And I had you know, a couple friends that, that were, that were gay. And I, again, kind of latched onto like their problems or my problems. Like I'm going to choose to take on, you know, their, their grievances with the church. And I became pretty openly hostile towards the church. I, um, I met with the Bishop locally, you know, I poor guy, he had never even heard of, you know, the, by the ways living in his ward. And we set up an appointment to go talk to him to resign our membership in the church. I was not nice about it. And I, I'm, you know, even now I, I can't even believe some of the stuff I said to him in his, in his office. Um, and it, it's everything from, you know, the, the low hanging fruit of church history it, to, uh, you know, onward and onward to the point where I, I was probably, I, I don't know if I was full blown atheist, but I was, I was teetering on that edge. I knew for sure I did not want to be, associated with an organization like the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that, that at, that I thought was advocating for such, um, terrible doctrine and, and, you know, openly hurting people. So I resigned my membership in the church. I, I said, I'm never going back. And now I was, I was full blown anti, I was participating in those forums and on those Instagram accounts. And I, I remember, I was now excited for general conference, um, not because how oh, I'm excited for it now as a, as a, you know, member, but I was excited because it was, it was almost like open season that all these young wide eyed in my mind, naive people were going to be going on Instagram and searching these hashtags, you know, general conference, you know, 2011 or something. And it 
all of the anti-Mormon posts out there, most people don't know this, but they, they use the same hashtags. And sometimes the pictures that they put on their Instagram posts are, they look like wholesome, you know, church, church photos, right? It'll be a temple and it'll say, you know, something, something witty and subtle. And then in the comments, it's just everyone railing on all these, these young kids that have come here like, Oh, I love, I love conference. I love what so-and-so said. And then it's just everyone bashing that person. And, Oh, did you know this about the church and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, my name was under there. I was saying the same things. I was doing the same things. I was just, you know, sitting there waiting like, Oh man, hopefully I can help these kids that are being duped. Right. I wish someone would have done this for me when I was 13 or 14. Like what a great opportunity for me to, to help them or, or whatever I was, I was saying to myself to justify this. And I, I continued that way for probably three or four years. And again, during this time, my, my drinking had increased a little bit. I was um, getting into smoking weed and, and throughout all of this, you know, my, my, ex-wife she was kind of getting into like mysticism I remember going to like psychic fairs and it just it, it seems so obvious now that we were trying to fill a cup that had a hole in the bottom you know what I mean where we were pouring in all this stuff and then we're like all right we're good and and it's like you leave the cup for an hour and you come back and it's it's empty yeah. right and you're like oh I gotta throw more stuff in here I gotta be even more angry with the church I need to drink more I need to try to get some of my childhood friends to partake in my, in my lifestyle. And, and it, it just seemed like a, a constant battle trying to find that next thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and this went on and, you know, now that I brought my friends, like I had some of the best friends through this whole thing. Some of my childhood friends that I had known since I was eight or nine, you know, we went to the same ward, high school, all of that. They, they were still my friend through the whole thing. Uh, you know, all of them went on missions and when they came back, they got married in the temple and they invited me to their, their temple to stand outside. And I went and they would come over to my Halloween party and watch me get just completely drunk. And they still continued to be my friend, which I'm sure was a very hard spot for them to be in. It all kind of came to a point when my marriage was starting to fall apart and I think it's honestly just that we were, we were going different ways. Right. So my, my ex-wife, she was kind of getting into, like I said, that mysticism um, type of, you know, spirituality. And I was staunchly against it because I I was like, why am I going to leave one thing? I don't even know if there's a God. There could be, I, I mean, I'm agnostic at this point and, and I'm, I'm trying to help people get away from that kind of thing. And we're going back to something that I felt resembled it. What exactly it, is mi- mysticism? I've never heard of that. Yeah. So, so mysticism, it's a lot of like those tarot readings, mm. um, like fortune right. type stuff. Like, I mean, I had gone to psychic fairs and had my fortune told. And, and sometimes, you know, it was like, whoa, how do you know this about me? And other times I was like, I can't believe I just paid however much money for this. Like, oh, well, at least we're going to get breakfast after this, <laughs> you know? But, but it, it's, it's all about that. Um, it, 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 you kind of hear people describe it as I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. Yeah. And it's kind of just finding their own way to connect to spirituality. And I, I'm not saying that all of it is bad. Um, I think it's, it's rare nowadays that people can be introspective and, and kind of look at how they find themselves. Um, I, I happen to think that there's, you know, a savior that can help us in that, in that road. It's not something that we have to do completely on our own. Thank heavens. But yeah, I just, I wasn't feeling any of that. I I thought I I can't leave the church. I can't, you know, completely turn my back on anything spiritual and religious. Like I can do it on my own. Like that's kind of how I felt. We we were kind of going these separate paths and ultimately we, we just, we came to a point where, I think our lifestyles became different. What we wanted from our futures were completely different. And we, you know, started to go through the motions of separating and getting divorced. Right. It was completely earth shattering because at this point, you know, I had been on and off talking to my parents for the better part of six years, seven years. Sometimes I was talking to them, sometimes not, you know, Christmas, maybe we were going to be there, maybe not. And at that point I remember pacing back and forth in my 
backyard and talking to my dad on the phone and kind of telling him what was going on. And, you know, he said, well, why, why don't you just come home? And I said, well, you know, we have so many things to take care of. And, you know, just so you know, dad, if I do take you up on the offer and I move home, I'm, I'm not going to church. Like you can't, you know, I'm out of it. Like you can't make me go. Mm -hmm. And, and he said, no, yeah, you know, I understand that. And I think my parents were a great example of just loving watching and waiting. There's a really good talk. Um, I can't remember who gave it. It's, it's called waiting, waiting on the prodigal son or something like that. And that's what, that's what this general authority talks about is loving watching and waiting. And that's what my parents did the entire time. They, they never stopped loving me. I always felt welcome. Um, and they were just watching and waiting. And my dad said, you know, you, you should move home. Cause at this point, you know, my, my ex-wife had moved out and I was just sitting in a empty house by myself. I moved home and I wasn't, I wasn't going to go to church. There's no way. I, I kind of started to think about it of, well, why do I feel this way? Is it, you know, towards the church? Is it actually my problem? Do I, do I know for sure? And while I was thinking about these problems, you know, and these questions I had, I, I never vocalized it to anybody. And one of my childhood best friends, he was actually getting married. Um, and it, it's kind of funny, you know, Mormon culture that, when they're getting married and they're in the singles ward, they kind of give like a farewell, you know, talk, <laughs> which I didn't understand that. Like he said, he's speaking in church. I was like, Oh, cool. And you know, I went and him and his fiance were speaking and I was like, it was kind of weird. <laughs> like I didn't know they did graduation speeches and I was like, I guess, <laughs> I guess it pans out. But I, I went and I heard him speak and I don't remember what he spoke about. Uh, I'm sure it was great. He's, he's a good dude. And he kind of just invited me. He's like, Hey, do you want to stay for elders quorum? And I was like, I don't know, man. Like I, you know, I thought you did a really good job, but like, can we hang out later? He's like, yeah, you should just stay. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I stayed and they were actually is so weird. This particular Sunday, the state president was coming to reorganize the elders quorum presidency. I'll never forget this experience because the state president, his name was president wall. And just to paint the picture that this guy, he's, he's kind of shorter in stature. I want to say he was probably five, 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 six, but just a spiritual giant. And I could feel it. I mean, he started talking and if anyone's watched sports movies, there's, there's often that time when like the head coach is kind of pumping up the team. Right. So I call this story kind of the halftime speech. Right. I, I was on the fence of like, am I going to, am I going to investigate the church as a full-blown adult that has just had his life completely shattered? Or am I going to just keep going the way that I'm going and just try to figure it out on my own? And so I'm kind of on the fence, right? It's like halftime for me. President Wall, or, you know, in my family, we started to call him Coach Wall. He's like going back and forth, you know, kind of pacing back and forth. And he's talking about Joseph Smith. He's talking about the Book of Mormon. He's talking about these factual things. And he's a very successful person. I know this about him. At first, I'm like, how can such a smart guy be fooled by this? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And some of the concerns he started bringing up, even in the anti, anti-Mormon anti forums and stuff like that, I was like, oh, that's a really good point. I was like, I've never researched that. I've never thought of that. And he's putting his glasses on and, you know, to, re to read something on a paper and he's taking them off and he's kind of pointing with his glasses. And, and it, it was, it was just amazing. And of course, everyone is kind of sitting there waiting, like, oh, what time do we get to go to linger longer and eat food? Right. And me, I'm just sitting there bawling. I have this, this huge beard and I'm, I, my tattoo is probably out. Cause I thought like, Oh, don't, don't approach me. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm unapproachable. I've got this big beard and this, you know, big tattoo on my sleeve I'm like nobody talked to me I'm not staying and I was over in the corner just bawling like I don't even know I don't remember what he said but he was just it was almost like he on his paper he had you know Josh by the way's concerns and and it was it was an itemized list and he was just checking them off one by one uh, of of everything with with Joseph Smith with the Book of Mormon with you know modern prophets and temple worship and and all this stuff and ultimately landing I remember the last thing that he landed on was talking about Jesus Christ. Everything leading up to that, you know, I, I, I vaguely remember, but he got to Jesus Christ. And I just remember thinking like, oh my gosh, like 
what am I doing? How, how am I doing this by myself? Like, how am I thinking I can possibly get through, you know, this, this crazy time in my life of, of, you know, thinking I need to quit certain things and I need to come back to church. How am I doing this alone? Afterwards, I was just like, oh, man, okay. I, I'm one of those people that I'm, I'm like, I have to either all the way do it or not do it at all. Right. And so much of my life, I was just kind of doing it, which is why I never really fit into either group until I was given the choice. So I, I said, you know what, I'm going to read the Book of Mormon. The, everything revolves around this book, right? Let's see what it's actually about. And my dad, I remember he he would wake up and read the Book of Mormon by himself every morning. And it, it was something that was hard for me to get in the habit of. But I remember waking up and coming out into the main living area and he was there and he said, you know, he, he's asking like, yeah, you ready? Like, let's do this. Like, let, let's read. And he did that every morning with me. And I mean, it was very early in the morning cause I, I worked very early and, and he, he did that and we read the book of Mormon. I said, okay, fine. While I'm going through this, like I'll talk to the missionaries, like whatever. I've talked to these guys before I've, I've, approach them on the street and, you know, done battle with them or whatever. And let's just, let's see what they have to say. It, it all just started to make sense. And I remember, you know, going through those lessons and being a friend to these missionaries that, that I started to remember. And I was, I was starting to think about how I felt as a kid when I was more in the church. Right. And it's a really weird it's really hard to articulate and really hard to explain to people, especially those that have grown up in the church that, that you can't really remember a time that you didn't have the Holy ghost. Like I, I, I can't remember specifically being a six or seven year old and not having the Holy ghost. And then of course you have it from the age of eight on. And you really don't even know that it's missing when you resign from the church because it's been gone for a while. Like the, the spirit can't be with you when you're doing some of these bad things. But then the contrast when you start to feel it all of a sudden, I remember praying was a very hard thing for me to get back into. For a while there, I was like, I'm just talking to myself in a room. Like, I, I'm, I'm not feeling it. And then all of a sudden, one night, I started to feel something. And I started to feel like I'm I'm not just talking to myself in a room. I'm, I'm having a conversation with someone. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that. And that was such an eye-opening experience for me to really connect and understand what the Holy ghost is. Right. And it's different for everyone, but for me, it was, it was a comforting old friend. I don't know. It, it was, it was the most, it was just a warm feeling of being embraced by an old friend. And it was it. And I, I had this distinct impression of like, I've missed you, <laughs> you know, and, and it, it was just a glimpse before I, I got rebaptized and I, I approached my, my bishop at the time. And, and I said, Hey, you know, like I, I want to be baptized. And, um, you know, he, he challenged me to, to pray a little bit more and then to fast. And I, I've, I never fasted in my life and I did. And it was very clear, like, yeah, I, I need to be baptized and I need to keep going and see where this is, where this is going to head. I had no idea at that time. I just, I thought I'm going through this divorce. It, it's gotten a little messy at times. There, there's tension with, you know, um, my wife at the time. And I, I got baptized. It was actually super cool. My, my younger brother who had just turned 16, he, he rebaptized me. Oh my gosh. So how old were you at this time? Yeah. So I, I had moved out when I was, you know, 18, almost 19 and got married about a year later. I was very young. And at this time I would have been 20, six. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it, it was like a seven or eight year hiatus and probably the later four ish, five ish years of that was, was trying to tear down the church and being as openly hostile as you can imagine. Wow. So I, I was, yeah, 25, 26. And then my, my younger brother, Jake, um, baptized me. That's so uh, special. Yeah. You know, one of my friends, like I talked about, who was there with me through all of this, like he spoke at my baptism and he said, you know, I, I knew you would come back. He said, I just, I was hoping it would be sooner rather than later. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to see that you're, you're getting this restart at the time in your life when you are. 
another friend of mine that spoke at my baptism, you know, he, he kind of highlighted the point of like, this doesn't have to stop. Right. Like this, this isn't a, you were baptized and then you did all these terrible things and then you have to be rebaptized. And he talked about the sacrament and he kind of helped me connect that relationship of what the sacrament really means and how we renew our baptismal covenants. Because again, I knew that, but I didn't know it for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now I'm like, I, I love going to church for the sacrament. And because I, I remember what that was like as a 25, 26 year old being baptized and feeling completely clean, that I can do that over and over again. That I can be conscious of, of the efforts I need to make to improve and I can feel re- repentant and I can, you know, partake of that ordinance and, and feel that again and again. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's what happened. And it was talked about for a little bit, like, oh, maybe I go on a mission because, yeah, I, now that I'm remembering, I was 25 and it was like, maybe he can go, maybe he can't. And my bishop, um, he asked, uh, you know, the folks downtown at Salt Lake City, I can't remember who was in charge of this, but um, if I could go on a mission and and they said no, that was tough. And, and honestly, it was an answer to a prayer because I, I didn't know for sure. And I, I think I was still on the fence at that point. It was fine though. The following year is when things really started to accelerate for me as I, I got my limited use temple recommend and I started going to the temple. I tried to go once a week. I, I went on like temple Tuesday, right. And did baptisms. And it, that was a crazy experience too, because it was where my parents live. They're pretty close to the Ochre mountain temple. I helped with the open house when I was in high school. And I remember having like very cool spiritual experiences that I completely forgot. And then going back as an adult and I going through to the baptistry for the first time, I was like, I remember like being through here, you know, like I I was helping with people in wheelchairs and I was like, I was like, how did I forget about that? How do you forget? And it just kind of as a side note, it, I, I remember people growing up saying like they would never forget the church the spiritual feelings that they felt. And it was usually, you know, like EFY or or Mm -hmm. youth conference or something. Now being on the other side of it, it's like you can. And and that's honestly like the scariest part is that you can have these amazing spiritual experiences, but you will forget. Mm -hmm. You can forget. And I've, I've seen it with friends that have gone on missions and, you know, in their homecoming talks, they describe these just, just insane stories of, of baptism and conversion and, and mostly for themselves. And then you fast forward a few years and they, they are completely out of the church. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you forgot. Yeah. I forgot so much of my childhood and so much of these spiritual experiences I had forgotten. Mm-hmm. You know, that year I started going to the temple and, and I, uh, you know, I was going to my singles ward and they gave me a calling and it was probably something like, you know, word activity director or something like that. I've I, I done that, that before. That was like the hardest calling I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to entertain and like get all these people to like mix and mingle and it's like it's okay we're gonna like each other it was really good because i i think in the bishop uh, his name is bishop Feinauer. I, I just love that man because he was there for me through all of this and i think he knew i needed that calling to you know surround myself with good people that were gonna keep me engaged and keep me remembering right mm-hmm. it was almost like i had i was a, this bad like amnesia patient and he was like let's put some like really good people around you to remind you of like who you really are and it brilliant. So I, I was going through this and I remember meeting my my wife now, Natalie. We we met through a mutual friend and it was I was doing like a musical number with a bunch of guys at like state conference and she's very musical person, um, plays the piano beautifully, and she was helping us kind of sort this out. And it's like, you know, my calling was hard, hers was harder, trying to get like these eight guys to sing in, you know, in some sort of tune. And I met her, I was dating someone um, kind of, and she was dating someone and, uh, you know, hey, yeah, nice to meet you, yeah, cool, whatever. And then two months later, like, I wasn't dating anyone, she wasn't dating anyone, and we decided to start going on dates. And it just seems so, so funny to me that, like, a childhood friend of mine was close friends with her, and that all these years later, that I would still be talking to him and that he would introduce me to my now wife. Again, one of, one of those one of those things where it's like friends that you've had for so long that just never really gave up on you, right? Mm-hmm. He introduced us and, and we started dating. Let's see, it was almost a, exactly a year. It was 13 months after I was rebaptized that I went through the temple and me and Natalie were, were 
sealed in the temple of Mary wow. was sealed. Yeah. And, and so that year of just like this massive progression of really investigating the church and just building line upon line. And, and it's amazing how quickly that happened for me that a year later I was, I was getting married in the temple, something I never thought I was going to do. And mm-hmm. then a year after that, our first son was born <laughs> and a year after that, you know, I'm going to BYU. I'm probably skipping over a whole bunch of stuff, but mm-hmm. it just kept going and going and going that I wanted to improve. And I, I now had the tools to do it. And it's amazing that, you know, I, I ran and I ran and I ran and I've heard someone, I, I can't remember who they talked about this, that you run as fast and hard as you can away from the savior. And then you stop and you kind of are catching your breath and then you turn around to see how far away he is. And he's like right there. Yep. I, I, I turned around and, and it, it's just amazing. Like I, yeah. the, the testimony I have of the atonement and feeling forgiven for the things that I've, I've done and the things that I've said, it's very hard to put into words. <laughs> I relate to your story so much. I, <laughs> I was a heroin addict and I had been sober for maybe like, I don't know, a year and a half or so when I was really like coming back and yeah, it was just, you, just same thing. Like, I mean, I, I think we got married when I was two and a half years clean and coming mm-hmm. back to church and then we got married in the temple and before that it was like i got my limited use recommend and then yep. you know a year later we got married in the temple and then a year later we had our baby girl yeah and my life has gotten better and better and just more blessings and i can just relate so much to yeah. what, what you're sharing and it's you're so right like as soon as you take that step back Mm -hmm. towards the savior it's like miracles just follow oh absolutely well well, and it's so funny how quickly the blessings come it's i don't know like how doctorally accurate this is but it's almost like i was missing out on those years of of blessings and then you know the second i turn to to come back to to christ and come back to the church that that it's like okay now and throw everything at him throw all of it you know (laughs) Totally. And, and, and it's just blessing after blessing and just reconnecting with people and just peace and all of these things that, that you're like, okay, obviously this is the right way to go. Like, I can't imagine coming back and it, it's being kind of wishy-washy, right? It was, it, if there was ever any wishy-washiness, it was definitely on my end yeah. and out, out of like my own hesitancy. But once I gave that up and I was just like, okay, fine, we're going to figure this out. We're going to see if this atonement thing is for real. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's for real. And yep. it just kept happening and happening and happening. And and to me, that is like such a miracle that that can happen. It's so true. It's I mean, listeners of this podcast have heard my story a thousand times, but I decided I was going to experiment and just see what was going to happen. Yeah. If I decided to come back and just mm-hmm. see. And it was like my whole life was transformed. Mm. that is the same thing that happened with you. And so, yeah, I just, I love that so much. And I, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give to family member, like a daughter, son, brother, sister, somebody that's really out of the church that mm-hmm. is just kind of hating on the church a lot in yeah. you know a public way? Like, what do you think would have maybe, I mean, obviously you talked about your parents and how they were Mm -hmm. just made such a difference, but like what advice would you have for just interacting with them? I think there's like a fine line between sticking up for what you believe in, but also like loving them in a way that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I think for one, it was, you know, like my tattoo example, right? I, I wanted, I wanted to fight. I wanted I wanted to be combative and and I'm not trying to generalize and say that everybody that leaves the church does this. The people that leave the church and then kind of get into that anti-Mormon, you know, mindset, they, they do feel like they're waging some sort of righteous war. Right. And it, it's very contentious. I never, I never got the reaction from the people that loved me that I wanted. You know, you don't think that that's the way to go. You're like, I got to stand up for, for my beliefs. 
And it's kind of funny like that. How many people's minds have been changed in the comment section on social media, right? And and honestly, it's so funny that the friend that I was talking about that invited me to hear him speak in the singles ward, um, he spoke at my baptism. He was, you know, my best man at my, my wedding when I was married in the temple. Um, he's actually since left the church. Hmm. Now we're on opposite sides, yeah. right? And he helped me so much. And I still struggle with how to handle him. And now I find out he's getting a divorce. Like, how did I respond to this that that helped me? And he he would post some pretty egregious, you know, like com- yeah. combative things on social media. And it got to a point where I just kind of had to not unfriend him because that's such like a dramatic thing. Like yeah. he's going to get a notification or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, I had to like stop following him. Honestly, you just have to know that that you're there. Because mm-hmm. when, it, it's not if, right? It's when these people turn, even slightly, just to look over their shoulder, they, they got to know that you're there, right? Yeah. My, my mom tells this story of, you know, Lehi's dream. Like, she loves that, that story in the scriptures, and she has, you know, paintings and, and stuff in her house. And I think she learned this at BYU Education Week, that y- you get to the tree, right, and you taste the fruit, and of course you want everybody to have it. Right. But you can't take it to them. Mm-hmm. And, and whoever this was, I can't remember who it was that was teaching this lesson, but they said, you don't leave the tree. You don't, you, you have to stay at the tree so that they know where to find you. Wow. Uh, yeah. That is profound. Cause my mom, she struggled with that too. She was like, how much do I, you know, follow Josh into finding out what's going on and, and try to talk oh. through it and help him. And she went to BYU education week while all this crap was going on with me. And that was the answer to her prayer is like, you have to stay at the tree. Josh has to know where to find you. Oh my gosh. Wow. Right. And yeah. it, it, it seems so, like such a crazy angle, but we don't really think about that. Right. It, it, kind of the end of the scripture story is that the people got to the tree and, you know, some of them are ashamed and some of them were, you know, happy, but then it's like, then what, you know, yeah. are we all just like sitting around staring at each other. It's like, well, no, we're waiting. We're waiting yeah. for everyone else to come to us. And so the advice I would give is that, you have to stay, you have to, you have to show an example and it doesn't have to be, you know, in some sort of preachy judgmental way, or, you know, you don't have to be uh, critical of them and and you try your best not to be judgmental of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have to fortify your testimony and you have to, you have to be there for them. And it, it might be in five years. It might be in 20, it might be longer. Right. But you fortify your testimony, you you love them, you watch, and you wait. Wow, I love that. I know that you mentioned the stake president when he came in and he was yeah. talking through all of the concerns, but there's so many things that people get stuck on. You yeah. know, even if they're active in the church, there's things with church history, with the LGBTQ, you yeah. know, so many things that people get stuck on and what advice would you have for those people with overcoming those hard questions? Yeah, no, honestly, that's, that's not an easy thing to answer. Um, and I think honestly, the, the best way I could answer that is that it's okay to have doubt. It's, o- it's okay to be unsure. And sometimes with, with some of those things, it's okay to honestly say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Especially with, you know, sometimes church history things. It's like, I don't know why that happened. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I wasn't there. And you can read all these accounts and these conflicting reports. And ultimately you have to just decide for yourself, like what, what's important to me? Is it important to me to, to know all of those details about church history? Does, does that change my opinion on the book of Mormon? Does that change my opinion on, on Christ as my personal savior? Ultimately I, I had to get to a point where, you know, I said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I'm I am okay not knowing. Mm-hmm. And I know that's not like an easy answer for people to hear, especially because when you're searching for those answers and those convictions, you you feel like you have to be 100% solid, right? Yeah. What I would say is that the primary answers, the easy things, the ones that you can get the most solid are the most important. And mm-hmm. like I said, at, at the center of all of it, it's, it's Christ as our personal savior. I, I know without a doubt, like that is the biggest thing for me in my testimony. It, you know, I'm not a great scripture reader. I'm, I'm not good at, at so yeah. many things, 
but I pray every night and I know that Mm -hmm. I need, I need that communication with my heavenly father and I need that savior to, to help me with my sins Mm -hmm. that I, I can continue to progress. I can continue to be better. Yeah. Yeah. That is so good. And Josh, after this episode today, we are reading scriptures with our families. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to go do it right now. (laughs) Yes. Right after this, for sure. (laughs) Just this whole, your story, your advice. Oh my gosh. So good. Um, (laughs) I'm so excited to post this episode because everybody is just going to love it. Um, Do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? For obvious reasons, I... I relate to Alma the Younger and the prodigal son. And it's such a sweet blessing, I think, to have people in your life that love you and care about you. Don't ever take it for granted is what I would tell people. Um, and even if you're you're having those doubts and you, you, you're you on the outs at the church for whatever the reason, um, just know that people love you. And, and more so than that, your Heavenly Father loves you. And Anyone that's grown up in the church that might be having this same kind of thing, ju- just know that y- you can't leave it. Like it, it's it's so hard, and and y- you see the people, and and I'm not saying you cannot be happy outside the church. This is something I've talked about multiple times. That I was happy, right? Yeah, I was happy outside the church, but I didn't feel as fulfilled in my happiness. Mm-hmm. And El- Elder Holland. Um, my one of my good friends he he calls elder holland like god's bulldog because he's like so passionate and like when he says something to you you're like okay yeah i know yeah um he gave a talk to some some missionaries in the mtc and he was relaying you know the story of of peter you know being asked by the resurrected christ of you know do you love me you know asking like three times and and elder holland says it more passionately of of like then feed my sheep like you can't go back like you, you, you've been a part of my, my ministry. You've been, you've been on this journey with me and now you're trying to go back to your boats. Right. And I feel like being born in the church and, um, you know, having that knowledge growing up, having that constant companion of the Holy ghost where you can't remember not having it. You, you can't go back to your boats. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's so hard to go back to your boats and it, you really have to make that conscious effort to follow Christ and, I just want anyone out there to know that that you will find fulfillment and joy and happiness and you will still have your struggles. You will still have your trials, but you will feel comforted in going through those trials and those negative experiences, having the companionship of the Holy Ghost and your Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that so much. I, I just think that this is such a, a brilliant idea. You know, we, we talk about, you know, the, the one sheep, right. And, 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 and ministering to the one, you know, the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more stories out there, like, like ours, right. Like yours and and what you've struggled with and, and mine kind of being on the other side and being on the, on the opposition. Right. And there's so many stories like this. And I, I think that we can give people hope if we, if we share these stories. And so I, I really appreciate that you put this together and um, give people like me a chance to blabber on about what I've been through in hopes that I can help someone. Yes. Well, and you will help so many people. I can guarantee that I'm going to have 10 emails from people saying, Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. That's exactly <laughs> what I needed to hear. Cause that's how God does it. He puts the person on the, the podcast on the week exactly that those people need to hear it it's been yeah wild to see the response so that's amazing i love it so awesome well thank you so much for being on the podcast thanks for having me i appreciate it so good